on March 5, 2020, long before most of us left the office or pulled our kids out of school, Dr. Marr posted a Twitter thread that said, Let's talk about airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses. A discussion is needed to improve accuracy and reduce fear associated with the term. She's among a very small group of scientists who truly understand the aerosol transmission of bacteria and viruses. Three years later, we're still wrestling with the implications of this virus and how we level the playing field by cleaning up our indoor air. And nobody understands the challenges we face and the opportunities in front of our faces, literally under and inside of our noses, like Dr. Marr does. Dr. Marr, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, we'll, we'll hopefully it'll stay that way. We'll, we'll see how we do here. Dr. Marr, we like to ask one question to kind of get things going. And instead of what is your entire life story, I like to ask, um, why are you vital to the survival of the species? And it's pretty ridiculous, uh, but I end up getting some actually fairly thoughtful answers out of folks, especially someone like yourself. Yeah, I didn't really think of myself as vital to survival of the species until 2020 rolled around and the, uh -huh. the coronavirus emerged. And, um, you know, people, Western medical officials and public health officials were saying, oh, you know, watch out. Don't stay, stay outside of six feet of people. It can only be transmitted by these large visible droplets that somebody coughs out and sprays into someone's eyes, nose, or mouth. And if you stay beyond six feet, you're fine. You know, it doesn't travel that far. So I knew this was dead wrong because we had studied flu transmission for quite a while and knew that the uh, kind of the current traditional understanding of flu transmission was also incorrect, um, likely to be incorrect about droplets. And so now we have this new virus and it was like, you know, people were being told the wrong thing about how to protect themselves. And there was not a, um, a proper understanding of how it was transmitting. And so, you know, my group and collaborators, students and postdocs, everyone I've worked with, um, although frankly, there are probably not that many people in the world, fewer than 10 or, -ish or so, who really understood how this was transmitted early on. And, um, yeah, so that's what we, we brought to the table. Um, and I re recognize, you know, there were articles in the New York Times, people at, at CDC talking about this idea, oh no, they don't, it doesn't travel, the drop, the virus doesn't travel more than six feet. And so, but I was like, oh yes, it, it probably does. And, you know, the way we've been thinking about transmission is really not uh, consistent with physics. And mm -hmm. so I started, um, you know, being more vocal about this because I knew that um, the existing thought was wrong and the information, the right information really needed to get out there quickly. Sure. Um, and so, so yeah, that is why I would say I was um, vital to the survival of the human species. <laughs> Look, it's a legacy question I've kept around for a while and we've just got some great stuff from it. Now, I, I will say, and I know you were one of the very early, again, among the 10 or so folks that, that seemed to really grasp the mechanics of, of how this was working its way through us. Um, and, and as much as I, we, I don't think we need to revisit all of that, I'm curious for for a few reasons, mostly, well, I guess it's half and half. One half is that my wife is a very talented and successful screenwriter, and I watch a lot of sci-fi movies, and so there's always the doctor that no one is listening to. Um, so you're sorry. I'm sorry, and you're welcome. Uh, but on the other hand, again, because our whole shtick here is sort of, again, action-oriented, and, and we've got students that listen, senators, scientists, farmers, you name it, but it, it's folks, as we say, it's science for people who give a shit. And there's a lot of folks that are seeking to do the right thing in whatever their job is, marketing, who can know. So I am curious, when, when you were like, I am as confident as I can be in the mechanics of how this seems to be working. And it, I know it was very early when in this whole shtick when you did this. What was your first outlet for trying to address that? Where was the first place you went when you said, I've got to try to change the minds here? It was Twitter. Um, 
you yeah. know, I had a small Twitter following at that point, maybe a thousand people, mainly people in the air quality community. But I remember posting in the end of January of 2020 in response to an article in the New York Times where they said, oh, you know, six key things about how, you know, how bad this pandemic is going to get. One of those things was, oh, how far does the virus travel? And it said, and they had a graphic, oh, the virus doesn't travel more than six feet, unlike measles and other some other things that travel hundreds of feet. And so I tweeted about this and I said, I'm not sure why people think this, but, you know, basically saying this is wrong. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that was it. And then in March, um, a colleague and I approached me, a colleague who recognized what was going on, he's an ex expert on kind of indoor air quality, approached me to write a commentary for medical journals. And so we did, we submitted that in March, it got rejected by a series of medical journals and then eventually got, got published. But um, at that point, also in March, there was a professor, Lydia Maroska, in Australia who was leading an international group to try to um, discuss this with the World Health Organization and really try to um, show them that, that the existing traditional understanding was wrong. And, and part of it, but, you know, nobody listens, cause, and I was used to this because I'd been studying this for a while, um, you know, you said that there's that one doctor who nobody listens to. Well, see, I'm not even considered a doctor. Like, this is a medical sure. question, right? And I'm sure. an environmental engineer. And so I don't think MDs, you know, know that people like me exist. And even if they do, a lot of them don't respect the or don't recognize the expertise that that uh, someone like me can bring about how viruses, which are basically small particles, how they move around in the environment, which is kind of what environmental engineers and aerosol scientists do. We study particles in the air and the virus, sure. a virus is just another type of particle to me. Sure. That's such a fascinating framing to me because, you know, we have not unexpectedly made this thing so political and much more complicated than it needs to be. But at the other, t uh, on the other hand, and I, I do want to get into this at one point uh, because it does matter. I'm a liberal arts major, right? This whole thing started because I'm not a scientist or doctor or any anything like that. But I can ask some questions and I can consider the intersection of really having to think about, okay, how, how do we message this thing to people if we're confident in it? Or how do we correct course if we need to, which obviously we needed to because we were doing it live. But that does require thinking about not only, okay, what is the environmental engineering, uh, you know, mechanics behind how air works, no matter what the particle is, to the sociology and behavioral psychology and behavioral economics of how people take in information or communicate it to each other, especially in the world of Facebook and things like that. So all of that said, and, and I want to get into those particulars, I'm curious if and, and where you feel like maybe since let's say March 2020, I think March 13th, something like that, when I yanked my kids out of school, where have we made any progress on indoor air quality, both either actually practically in the real world, in public schools with all that money that was available or whatever, or just in our basic understanding of, of how, um, again, of sort of, as I've called it in, in my writing, you know, needing to level the playing field, essentially, uh, with, with this air. Where do you feel like we've made a step up, if at all? I think we've made a huge amount of progress in the past couple of years, like progress that I would was thinking would take decades to achieve. And so the pandemic really accelerated that. So indoor air as a research field was kind of the, uh, the, the I don't want to say the black sheep, but just like the kind of ignored, the, the poor stepsister compared to outdoor air quality uh -huh. um, and atmospheric chemistry. Those, that's like the big guns and the kind of more, mo there's more money in that field and more attention given to that. Um, but, you know, we spend 90% of our time indoors, as many people have heard now, and we're breathing that air. And we, we, we don't think about it that much or until until the pandemic, we didn't really think about it that much. But it turns out that, you know, what we're breathing has profound impacts on our health, our productivity, our academic performance and our, our wellness. And the, uh, you know, the pandemic has made that clear. So I think there's a lot more awareness about indoor air quality and the importance of ventilation and filtration. You know, that has 
better ventilation and filtration have been introduced into some public spaces, some schools. So that's a huge step, that um, a huge change that didn't happen before. There's discussion now um, um, at you know, local, state, and federal government levels about providing guidelines and maybe even kind of standards for indoor air, which again is something that I thought would take decades to, to get to. Are you, thank you for that. Um, it's always nice to hear a little like, no, we, 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 we are getting there. And a lot of these things were pulled forward, which is, I mean, obviously we had to go through health to, to get there, but often that's what makes us move, unfortunately. But do you feel a sense of frustration at all that, that we aren't doing enough knowing what we know now? Um, whether it's, again, on the on a school or school district or office level or state, local, federal level, when you're like, look, we're three years in, we have all this information, it's not just this. Not every kid needs, just because someone at the school has, has the flu, like doesn't mean everyone has to get it. Like we know what we're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm frustrated, I guess, as a scientist. Um, and that was true, you know, I've studied both indoor and outdoor air. And with outdoor air, it's very clear what we need to do. We need to you know, reduce our emissions of various pollutants. Um, and with indoor air, it's very clear what we can do, um, which is improve ventilation, filtration, kind of treating the air like w cleaning the air, like we clean the water before we drink it. But as a person, you know, I recognize that there are so many barriers to actually implementing these changes, which are economic, social, political. So, um, yeah, you know, I would like to see that happen faster and you know I know what could be done but I also recognize that we live in a society where and a democracy where things are you know it's slow to make these changes there is a massive massive methane leak uh Alito Ranch I believe it was called so, oh, Alito I Canyon remember Ranch. that yeah I yeah. talked about that in my class perfect so what was super interesting being there for that, and that was before I had any idea about any any of this stuff, um, was you couldn't see it. And that was really interesting because for all of the pollution in Los Angeles that's gone up and down, whenever we have wildfire smoke, you can see it, you can feel it, you can taste it with your inside or outside. I mean, we have all out there experienced that, and a lot of people on the East Coast have experienced that now too. Like you said, outdoor air pollution is the big, the big thing. But it was interesting how much, for as catastrophic as it was to air quality and, and emissions, even if they're short term, they're much more intense because it's, it's methane, how much less people were aware or gave a shit because they just couldn't see it. And I was telling someone much younger than I am uh, the other day about, I, I was in college when... Um, it was either after my first or second year when New York, I went to Colgate University, when New York State stopped smoking in bars and restaurants. And so I remember the fine line between that, that first year and then the next year being like, oh my God, my clothes don't smell as terrible. I can see people across the bar. My asthma doesn't feel terrible. It seems to really matter, which I guess it makes sense. What we can see in water or in air and what we can taste and what we can feel. And like you said, this virus is deadly or, and... and we have all these other ones, but we really can't see that. And I wonder how much you think that has slowed some of the action we, we've taken and that people are just going back to school and going back to the office and they don't know how much their air is filtered. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge part of it. And I think that also contributed to our kind of misunderstanding about transmission of viruses and other pathogens through the air. We can see these large droplets that you know, if someone coughs or sneezes or talks and we see those, we understand that those might be contaminated with viruses or bacteria. But the, the thing is that for every one of those that we release, there are hundreds of tiny particles that we can't see. And you need specialized instrumentation in order to, to see those or count them and know how big they are. And I think we are, we are we're a strongly visual creatures and we can't see it. And so one of my dreams has been that, you know, we when eventually when we all have our VR glasses that we're walking around in, that right. 
it that it you know projected onto that screen is like pictures of all the the pathogens that are in the air so you would see it like coming out of you know someone's infected you see them walking along you see it coming out of their mouth and you see them drifting around and if you could see those then you might like take a different path or you know you see them sure. like building up in the room might get out of that room or put on your mask um, so absolutely that yeah that's my dream the vr glasses that allow us to see the pathogens around in the air around us that would i think that would be a game changer i mean you would think so there's this um when i was in los angeles the hospital system i went to and 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 which to was very good to my wife and i when we had our kids and, and they were wonderful at cedar sinai among the biggest and, and and best in the country there's this legend and i'm sure i'm getting this wrong or it's only half true that years ago they were trying to get more people to just sort of stop and wash their hands, right? Doctors, nurses, whatever it might be. And and I guess the legend was that doctors kind of kept blowing it off in some way or as much. And someone, I guess they did a, uh, what is it when you, when you like put a sample on a slide? Anyone, someone made like a sample of like hand bacteria and put it on a screensaver on some of the computers so that people could just see like, n no, this is what you're carrying around. Even you might feel like you're clean, but you're also operating on people and you're, you know, you're with a bunch of people who are immunocompromised. Like it matters to be able to visualize that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's why, that's why I want the magic glasses. I, I'm here for the magic glasses. If I could use that to show my children how to pick up their room, which I can see the things on the floor, but apparently they cannot. It's yeah, it's amazing how kids are like that. It's very strange. Um, uh, it doesn't make any sense. I'm sure I was not like that. Um, so on that note, we're not going to have those magic glasses for a little bit. What would you say, again, as an environmental engineer? Am I getting that sort of category correct? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm hard to categorize. If I had to be categorized, I guess that would be. <laughs> I'm not trying to put you in a thing. box. That's that's fine. I mean, I'm I'm kind of you have know, done a lot of interdisciplinary research, and uh, that's kind of how I got in. How I became one of the few people who who kind of specializes in this area, kind of bridging sure. medicine and aerosol science and engineering. But yeah, go ahead, call me an environmental engineer. Let's call you the Oracle. So as, as the oracle of air quality, um, obviously there's a thousand different versions, if not more, of these situations and setups, if there are any. But what would you say, let's, let's go to like lowest common denominator. What would be sort of your, from an engineering standpoint, mechanical standpoint, your lowest common denominator prescription for how a school or office should improve their air cleaning or circulation or both you know what are sort of the basic tenets of things that you can probably need to do for your place yeah one would be to remove the sources so there's a you know colleagues of mine talk about some old book which talks about well you know if there's a pile of poop in your room and it smells what do you do right. you remove the poop okay right. so you remove those sources um, that's the first thing. Um, and you know, if you're, if it's, you've got a fire fires, of course, cooking, that gives off lots of stuff. Of course we have to do that, but if it doesn't yeah. need to be there, you can remove that. Um, and then the second thing would be to ensure that our air is not stale. So you want to kind of be changing over that air, bringing in, you know, cleaner outdoor air, presuming there's not wildfires going on and you're not in some terribly polluted city. Um, bring in that outdoor air, replace some of that kind of stale indoor air, and you can also filter the air to remove the particles. So those are the things we can do. Now, as kind of uh, people going around, what, you know, I think one thing that would help us see these things is if people kind of had, you know, we know we go into a room, maybe there's a thermometer on the wall, so we know what the temperature is. Well, we could also have a kind of carbon dioxide sensor on the wall like this, which tells you- I have like five of those. Great, okay. So this tells you, kind of gives you an indication of ventilation, a lower number kind of is better, because if it's higher, that means that there's lots of people's exhaled breath that's building up in the air and it's not being removed. Um, but you, you could have a high number on the CO2 monitor and, and have low particle concentrations if you have filtration. So you might also wanna have some kind of 
particle indicator that tells you about the amount of particles in the air. And that's not just virus particles, that would be total all types of particles. And those are really important because we know that, you know, the World Health Organization estimates that exposure, people breathing in particles in indoor or outdoor air is responsible for seven to eight million premature deaths per year. Yeah. And we know it's linked to things like academic performance and, you know, um, people absenteeism from school and work um, and productivity. Well, and that's what is so compelling and I guess frustrating to me on the trying to level the playing field here of us against these viruses and bacteria or wildfire smoke, whatever it may be. I had this wonderful conversation with Mary Pernicki out at Stanford about wildfire smoke and where she was, a, you know, the question was essentially, obviously, what can each of us do for ourselves in those situations? But obviously, the, the, the greater fight of, of, of trying to reduce the, the severity of these. But, you know, her, her point was, no one knows more about this than I do. And I know it's pretty damn bad, but I don't know how bad. And it's going to take some time because any exposure to that kind of stuff really matters. And like you said, the, the little Aeronet, right? Aeronet 4, is that what it is? You know, it's not going to tell you the particle count of anything. Right. What it's going to tell you is just like, is your air stale, essentially? Like, is it not being circulated much less sort of, like you said, it can be cleansed, but it can still be a, a, a closed room. Um, and like you said, though, also, that can be more complicated if you're in a place that's uh, where the outside air is also contaminated in some way because you can't just bring in uh, in in outdoor air. Now, I know the administration at one point, the federal administration, I, I don't remember what the mechanics of the legislation were, but there was an enormous amount of money they put out for schools and offices to go after their HVAC. And obviously, Again, it's not just money that's going to do that. You need, we have a massive shortage of electricians and HVAC installers and, and all kinds of things like that. It's not as easy as here's a check, go rip everything out. Kids are in school, this and that. Do you have any knowledge of sort of how that's going, how much uptake there has been there, any common obstacles that folks are running into on that front? Yeah, I have, you know, I was involved at with, in discussions kind of with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I know a colleague has said that, um, you know, only a minority, a small amount of that money has been spent so far, which is which is fine. They, they still have time to spend it. And, you you know, there aren't enough HVAC technicians in the world for everyone to call on them all at once to come upgrade their systems. So, but, but over time, you know, I do hope that money gets spent on upgrades to HVAC systems um, and other things to to improve air quality. I think there's there's some barriers. One is that people, some people, a lot of people still don't appreciate. I think the the importance and the impact they can have by upgrading HVAC. Um, a second is, of course, having the expertise around HVAC technicians. And then we we ran. I ran a workshop with the put on by the National Academies where we had someone from, I think it was a, you know, kind of facilities engineer with a school district. And he said, yeah, people just don't know what to do. Um, and so I think we need more explicit guidance about what to do. And there, there are some really good resources out there. Um, the CDC has a really nice web page on ventilation improvements. Mm -hmm. And the EPA came out with the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge. And they have a kind of a tip sheet, like it's two or three pages long, but with very specific things that you can do to upgrade your HVAC system or upgrade your ventilation, ranging in cost from, you know, very low, like opening windows at certain times or building your own air filtration unit called the Corsi Rosenthal box with oh, yeah. you know, a, box, a box fan and four air filters um, to, to upgrades of your HVAC system. But one, you know, one place we really need to start is just making sure that your HVAC system, if you're in a big building, making sure that the system is working the way it was designed to work. Because I think a lot of mm -hmm. these have just fallen into neglect and they're not really working the way they are supposed to work. So that that's really the place to start. Well, and I'm sure, I mean, you know, so many of our issues now and as we confront, you know, sort of the climate impacts that are coming towards us, whether they're ones we can slow like heat or ones we cannot like sea level rise, are going to be because we tend to build infrastructure and then never touch it again. And I know that so many, again, having lived in Los Angeles for so long, so many of the public schools are just 
in shambles. You know, we, we get, forget the uh, teachers with 30 plus kids in the classroom and it's hot and it's smoke and it's mostly black and brown kids who, who are in these, you know, just garbage schools, which isn't any fault of the teachers or administrators. We just don't touch these things. So it makes sense, you know, when you say like, you got to start at the base level. Like, does the HVAC work? Is there HVAC? Does it work? Does it do anything? Are there any filters? When have they been changed? You know, is there is there mold in the system? Things like that. Um, it's a it's a tall ask, but it it does seem not to be too dark. But you know, I remember after the the Newtown shooting, thinking if we're not going to deal with guns now, when are we going to do that? You know, and it feels like we, we've still got a hundred and we've made enormous strides against this thing, obviously. Um, but we're still four or five hundred people are, are dying a day in the U.S., which is 140,000 a year or whatever. Like, when are we going to really start pushing this as much as we can? Understanding that the, the, the logistical difficulties and the political and economic difficulties are a lot, but it just seems like this is the window to do that. Yeah, this is our golden opportunity, um, and things are happening, so that's good. You know, is yeah. it baby steps? Um, yeah, and you know, if I would say if there is some kind of state level or federal level indoor air standards to kind of parallel what we have for outdoor air, things will happen. Yeah, how have you reconsidered? Or are you like, we're already nailing it? Like, how, how have you reconsidered, or if you could go back to the beginning, sort of building your team and how you teach and how you communicate and how you try to be effective? Is it bringing in, now knowing what we know and how difficult this all is and the opportunity we have and, and that there will be future pandemics and we're still dealing with measles and flu and all that stuff, how have you thought about, okay, I need to approach this in an even more multidisciplinary way or interdisciplinary way, or maybe I'll bring in a, a more economics folks into my team so we can think about that level, whether it's micro or macro. Has that affected your job at all and how you approach everything? Yeah, it has a little bit um, in recent years. I would say I've kind of always appreciated and sought to have a interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary scientific and engineering team. So I'll try to bring in people with backgrounds in mechanical engineering and microbiology and environmental mm -hmm. engineering, aerosol science, atmospheric chemistry. So I really like having that mix of diverse backgrounds in our group. Um, I think we all, you know, can, we don't know necessarily early on what the other people are doing or talking about, but through <laughs> over time and working together, we, we do get there. And I think we sure. are able to break through some, some of those disciplinary boundaries and look at really these interesting problems. But I have become convinced, and actually I'm glad you brought this up, that you know, in order for us to make more progress on this, it's not just standards, but it's actually showing that there is an economic payoff to be had here. So I have been thinking about teaming up with economists, for example, to, to look do more of these careful kind of benefit cost analyses. Um, to convince people, hey, you know, this makes sense. We're leaving money on the table if we don't include, upgrade our HVAC in terms of absenteeism and health costs and productivity. Um, so definitely that. And then on the, you know, I've collaborated with a historian, which which and and an English student or rhetoric student, and that turned out amazingly well to really try to understand where this kind of misunderstanding about transmission came from. And so that was that was really key because, yeah, I could sit here and say, you know, I'm right, you're wrong as much as I want. But I think people in order for people to appreciate that more, they, they need to understand why and where that's coming from. Sure. Why are why was our understanding wrong? If I can um, interrupt you, can you yeah. speak for a minute about that a little bit? Because so, it does matter, again, as much as I'm trying to push forward and affect, as we say, like a, a better today and tomorrow, it does matter how we got here because – it improves our ability to course correct as we go, because we're certainly not going to keep getting it right. So I, I would love if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, I had always wondered, since I first started reading papers about flu transmission, um, why there was, they, they, they always talked about, oh, there's droplet transmission, those are the large visible wet droplets that spray onto someone's face, and then there's airborne or aerosol transmission. And it talked about a dividing line 
um, between these a, a certain size of droplet. And it, it always talked about five micrometers or maybe 10 micrometers. Now I know that people don't, you know, I know what that means, but size wise, but uh, let's say your, your hair is maybe 50 to 100 mic micrometers or microns in diameter. So we're talking okay. about something that's 10 times smaller than the width of your hair. And uh, it was just totally wrong because I knew and other aerosol scientists know that a particle that is five microns in size floats around for a long time. That is not, you know, things a little bit larger than that are not behaving like these ballistic cannonball type of droplets that fly into someone's face. If I release a particle that's five microns in size from the height of my nose when I'm standing, it takes half an hour for that to fall to the ground. In the meantime, is that because it's can, so light? It's very light. It's very small. Um, yeah, it just takes a long time to, to fall to the ground. Sure. Um, and so that really bothered me. And that was, I don't know, 15 years ago. And there was one other person at the University of Hong Kong who, who I talked about with this. And he was also frustrated by this misinformation uh, or misconception. And so he kind of did some digging and it really hit a dead end. He wrote about this in a paper he published a couple of years ago. Um, and so I, I just, uh, you know, I was, I really wanted to know where this came from. And, you know, the pandemic kind of accelerated that. And then I spoke with a colleague at uh, University of Colorado, Jose Jimenez, and he was saying, well, in atmospheric chemistry, there was this kind of this, this myth that was, you know, everyone went back and cited this one paper, but it turned out that paper didn't say what everyone thought it said. Like it just kind of became embedded. Like everyone just this, everyone just cited it. And so everyone else just cited it. And, and in fact, a lot of people cited a certain paper from 1936 by um, William and Mildred Wells about this idea of airborne transmission and this five micron cutoff. But I, in reading through that paper, I could not find any mention of five microns. In fact, they wow. talked more about 100 microns, which is correct. So I was really frustrated and curious about where this idea, the incorrect physics came from. And I had been working with, or I had known with a historian at Virginia Tech, history professor who studies pandemics because he, he, had, he was running a workshop for teachers and wanted to, several years ago, wanted to come, you know, bring them to my lab so I could talk about flu transmission. So we did that. Um, and he and I, at the beginning of the pandemic, kind of corresponded occasionally about mask wearing and kind of the history of that. Um, so anyway, I reached out to him and said, hey, we've got this question, you know, where did this wrong idea come from? And he, he suggested, well, we need, you know, we need to get um, someone who studies medical rhetoric on board, which is the idea of how certain, uh, or just the study of how certain ideas take hold. And mm -hmm. so he brought in, recommended a graduate student, Katie Randall, and um, she's the one who really did the hard work. So we, we had you know, several meetings over a period of several months and kind of talked about this problem. She started digging through the literature, kind of doing backwards and forwards, citation searching. And eventually she, she had this kind of breakthrough where she determined that this, this idea and our, all of the thinking about airborne transmission came from tuberculosis. And so tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria. And the, the interesting, the different, the thing that's a little weird about tuberculosis is that you have you breathe in the bacteria but it can only in, cause an infection if it gets deep in the lungs that's where there's the mm. right cells where it can attack okay. and so in and and in fact to reach the deep lungs it's really only those very small particles that can reach the deep lungs smaller than five microns and so kind of all of our uh, tuberculosis became the basis for all of our understanding i think about airborne versus droplet transmission even though with other respiratory diseases, particles that are larger than five microns, you can breathe them in and they can like attach to receptors in your nose or somewhere higher. They don't need to get to your deep lung to cause infection. And so, you know, I'm probably down in the weeds here, but anyway. No, no, I, this, I love it. No, I, this, it, it really does matter because it's just, again, like it's the whole, like if you could take a time machine and change like one small thing, what's the butterfly effect? And like, this was the thing that everyone banked on. This it, was the thing. CDC started saying this back in the 90s or so about, oh, you know, things, it, it, airborne transmission involves things smaller than five microns, droplet transmission in, involves things that are larger. This kind of became further entrenched with the original SARS outbreak in 2003 when um, uh, I think 
people, the, the medical community became convinced that it was transmission occurred only when you were doing certain medical procedures, like intubating someone in the hospital, mm -hmm. and that that generated aerosols. Um, but otherwise, you would not generate aerosols. But I think they, they also didn't realize that when we talk or breathe, we're all, we are releasing aerosols. Talking and breathing is an aerosol generating procedure, sure. um, but they didn't recognize that. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's it's so instructive. You know, it, it it's different, but parallels a little bit. Um, you know, the news about um, the past twenty years of Alzheimer's research that's sort of come out this year about how the first study uh, was fabricated a little bit, and then it turns out that is what we have based all of our research and funding on. Um, you know, all the brain plaques, everything. And I fully understand when the smartest brain folks say. The more we pull the string, we more we discover like what we don't know about this incredible machine, right? But at the same time, it's to to have so much money go again to go into something like Alzheimer's treatments, preventions, whatever it might be, for so long and to constantly have everything fail. At some point, somebody goes, "But why? You know? But but why? Like what? Wh where do we have to go back to?" I feel like one of the things I get asked about a lot um, from from folks is when we made the move to focus so much more on, I guess, personalized medicine and less on public health over the last hundred years. Um, you know, when we had, obviously we, <laughs> there was the low hanging fruit of like, turns out you should wash your hands and your water should be clean. Um, you know, and, and don't, 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 don't poop where you eat. Don't, don't put things in the water. Don't bury bodies, you know, next door. But at the same time, you know, it does seem like we stopped revisiting these things. And that's why it's always so interesting to see all these new meta studies, right, which go back and try to replicate old studies about whatever it is, psychology, anything, and to see well, how often they do fail. Yeah, there's an interesting um, kind of rationale for why, part of why I think there's been a dearth or lack of research in this area, which is that, you know, up until through the 1970s, there was still a lot of studies papers on kind of survival of viruses and bacteria in droplets and in aerosols. And then it, it kind of stopped. And I've, I've read, I don't know if this is true, that maybe one of the reasons that stopped is because then we had, you know, lots of anti antibiotics, um, which, you know, kind of crushed infections. And so we were no longer worried about infections. Cancer became the thing. And then research in this area pretty much stopped. It's unfortunate. I mean, again, you you get it because there are these. I'm a big fan of the 80 20 theory. If you've nope. heard of that, it's in, you know, 80, uh, for instance, 80% um, of your, if it's a company, 80% of your profits come from 20% of your company, uh, customers, whatever it might be. It's the idea that, like, to simplify, if you one big lever, like get everyone to stop smoking, is going to fix a lot of things right both uh, lung cancer and and it's going to make people go to restaurants more all, all these different things and it besides the again the chase where we, with this where we went down antibiotics or or with alzheimer's or or whatever it might be um you hinted early on about how you you understand obviously because you've always sort of had this multidisciplinary approach to things and especially over the past few years that it's not so easy as just saying like, look, if we clean the air, the, the, people are gonna be healthier. You, we, not everyone will get COVID. The n enormous amounts, both in variety and, and magnitude of the co-benefits from something like cleaning indoor air, from kids are just gonna be in school more. I get an email every week uh, from, from school saying, listen, your kids, I mean, my kids uh, don't really miss that much, but the, the, the point is like, they don't have to get sick, but also, they stay in school more and most schools get their funding from how often the kids are in schools and people will be at the office more if they're healthier. It's the same thing as the co-benefits from paid sick leave or paid family leave or things like this. It's like, all right, fine. If we're not going to fund childcare in this country, then you have to have people have to have the ability to stay home and take care of the kids. Otherwise they're not coming to work for you, you know, and then GDP is lower if we still want to keep thinking about that, whatever it is. But I come back to this idea of, and feel free to shoot this down. Um, sometimes it seems like from a human perspective, societal perspective, there are things we encounter that are maybe too big or too complicated or 
require too much change. We kind of don't want to be true. Does that climate change, for example, make climate change? The fact that, again, we have made so many strides against this, but in part because the booster uptake is so low, in part because we didn't vaccinate the world, all these things, we're still going to lose 140,000 people this year, right? We got a new top six cause of death, and we've sort of normalized that and moved on from it. What do you think, I guess, how do you feel like that may have pushed on push back against your arguments in the beginning that, no, listen, we have to think about this as airborne. I guess, what was the waterfall? If, if everyone had said, yes, okay, great, it's airborne, what did that actually require from them if they acknowledged that that was true? I guess, what logistically would that have required from a healthcare perspective, from an industrial perspective, things like that? If for them to say, they can't just say yes, that means what else did they have to do for that to be true? Yeah, that's that's may have been one of the hurdles to kind of wider and more rapid acceptance of airborne transmission. Because if you say, well, this is an airborne virus, that means in healthcare settings, so hospitals and everything, um, airborne is kind of like a, a trigger word. And it means that you have to provide all the workers with N95 respirators that have been uh, so-called fit tested. So they have to go through and make sure they're, they seal well to the face then all the patients are supposed to go into negative pressure rooms called airborne isolation infection rooms. Um, and it's costly. There are not enough of these types of room, patient rooms in hospitals. And so I think there was a real reluctance to, to say the word airborne in, in healthcare and in infectious disease control settings. So that, you know, that was a, a barrier. And then it would also well, if it's airborne, then maybe some people think, oh, there's nothing we can do about this. We have, we give up. I, you know, I give up. Um, but that's not true because we know there's things we can do, um, sure. things like masking and, you know, having cleaner air, better ventilation and filtration. But, uh, you know, it took a, a lot of people, I think, just thought of airborne transmission as this, like, really mysterious, dangerous thing. I don't know if you saw the movie Contagion um, oh, yeah. where there was a – you know, there was an, an air, some airborne pathogen that was killing lots of people. And, you know, like this guy's in a movie theater and he looks up at the ventilation system at the vents and he sees, you know, they visualize it's cartoon, of course. That, but, the, you know, the, these whatever the pathogen was, the virus coming out, blowing towards him in the air. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's everywhere. And right. there's nothing you can do about it. So I think airborne transmission has had that connotation associated with it. Um, but... Uh, so I think there was some fear about saying that. Yeah. I, and I, I, apologize, I apologize if that didn't make any sense. The, the question, I guess it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm just so curious about, because it, it, it's never just, if you have any sort of responsibility in an organization, whatever it might be, or to a family or a class, acknowledging something, it doesn't usually stop there. There's usually a laundry list of actual practical ramifications that come with that. And, and again, I do to try to make the, our our community and, and folks in general as effective as they can be it does it is important to stop and try to empathize with those things you can't just say well too bad that's the way it is it's like you know the arguments for degrowth it's like sure that sounds great but like how politically feasible is that not a lot um <laughs> you know so you you do have to work around that sure you can then take a further step back and try to elect more people who who agree with you and change it that way but the point is like it's not so easy and i I don't want to pretend it is, but at the same time, I'm a big fan of, uh, there's an economist, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, and she wrote this great book a couple years ago called The Mission-Based Economy, I think. Um, and to very simplify it, it's essentially like, okay, if your mission is put a man on the moon and bring him home alive, that's very clear, it's very measurable. He either gets there and he comes home or he does not. And what you can do is then reverse engineer and design all of your teams and processes and milestones against, is that going to get us there? Is this thing you want to ship with it? Is it going to help achieve that? If not, get it out of here. You know, are these milestones along the way? And it's the same thing for net zero pledges or, or like you said, designing clean air standards for inside, whatever it might be, or, or, or water. Um, it does seem like setting that helps because then you can – help to maybe remove some of those limitations and make those logistics easier all along the way for folks. Like you said, we just didn't have those negative pressure rooms. 
Well, yeah, we also didn't have clear goals, I think. Um, you know, it was, was it uh, to prevent as many deaths as possible? Well, then we'd be in lockdown forever. That's not feasible. Sure. Was yeah. it, you know, I would like to think we would all agree that, you know, maybe the goal is to avoid overwhelming the healthcare system. Um, but I don't know that that was ever clearly stated. Um, and so that, that makes it harder. And then, yeah, and it was, you know, so it was kind of this, big nebulous goal maybe um or not non-defined goal sure. lack of goal i guess that that hamstrung us too so if you could be the take your role as oracle of air quality and become as americans like to say that our air quality czar what what are your first sort of few moves understanding the where we are politically, sociologically, economically, across the more to to set, let's say, starting with federal air standards. You know, what are the things that you feel like are measurable and achievable? Yeah, I would probably set some kind of federal standards like we have for outdoor air. And these would apply to public buildings. So where there's lots of people, you know, what goes on in your house can stay in your house. You know, it's up to you. Okay. and. Right. And yeah, your friends who come <laughs> over, but in places like schools and grocery stores and, you know, performing arts centers, uh, you know, where, sure. where lots of people congregate. Um, I think there's a couple of standards that would make sense. One of those would be for carbon dioxide levels as an indicator of ventilation, as you know, we talked about the Aeronet 4 sensor um, and keeping that below a certain level. And then the other would be for particles uh, in the air, total, kind of total particles in the air. Again, because it's not just about viruses, but it's about the other things, the cigarette smoke type particles, which are, the, which are you know, all around us. Do and we have I accessible think, ways of measuring particles uh, we, that, for instance, with effort could be rolled out to schools, the version yeah, of your net Yeah, you know, there's already, um, there's, you know, the, I, lower cost sensors that can measure particles reasonably well um there's something called like the purple air uh, oh yeah i've got those for oh that's right i forgot they do an indoor one now too it's the same same sensor you just put okay. it indoors and then if you go on their map it has like a black bold line about sure. it to show that it's indoors so yeah okay you could have that indoors and those are i don't know i bought mine i have a whole box of them 150 dollars each yeah I've um and so yeah if you put those in your school and things, okay, and then, you know, like a carbon monoxide alarm, if the level goes above a certain amount, the alarm goes off, or a smoke alarm, it goes off, and you realize, okay, we need to do something here to, uh, you know, our air quality's gotten really bad, it's harming us, we need to, you know, turn, crank up the HVAC system for a bit, or, you know, upgrade our filters, or bring in a, a portable air cleaner for, you know, this period of time. That makes sense. It all seems so rational. Yeah. But you know it costs money, and that's sure people don't want to spend money. There's there's other other things. There's always competing priorities. But that's where I think the economic economist and cost benefit analysis comes in. If you can show that yeah. you know doing these things is going to have a ten times payoff, then maybe people will think about it more seriously. One would think we're we're big on the bean counting, um, and it it does seem like the more you can. Uh, show your work, uh, the better. If we can't visualize these things with your magic goggles, uh, then hopefully we can show people how it'll just save their company or their state or whatever it is, some dough, or actually increase it. Because again, people people will, will be there more. Um, any other specific sort of recommendations uh, you have for, again, folks with any sort of response, organizational responsibility, whatever it might be. Again, the Aeronet's great for showing just uh, is your air stale, it's, it's, it's CO2. Um, I put one in my little workout room where my Stairmaster is. Not great, Dr. Marr. Let me tell you, after five minutes, it, it is I'm lucky I'm not passing out in there. Well, it's all that heavy breathing you do when you're working out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not ideal. Um, but if nobody else is in there, it's just you then. Right, yeah. and then someone will find me on the floor someday. It'll be yeah. fine. My children are waiting for that moment. Um, Okay, and then the purple layer is great. You feel like those uh, work pretty well? They were so popular, and I, I definitely picked up a few of them myself. Yeah, I think they, they, they work well enough. Um, and then the other thing, okay, so that kind of tells you what's there, but what can you do sure. about it? The yeah. other thing that, that I've done since the pandemic and other people have done is to get one of these portable you know, air filters, uh, high-efficiency particulate air, HEPA type of filters for 
for rooms. So we, you know, I got one for the house and we run it when uh, someone's sick. And Mm -hmm. if I lived in somewhere with wildfires, I would definitely be using it then. Uh, When we have a cooking accident, for example, and there's lots of smoke in the air, we can use it then to help uh, bring down the particle levels because we're coughing and everything. Um, But so I think that's a, a good tool to to have around especially if you live in a place with lots of wildfire smoke yeah yeah um i i've definitely got a few of those we've got some pretty heavy dust allergies in my house and and we run those and i'll show the kids every i think it's like every two weeks the alert pops up i open it up to vacuum off the things and the kids are just like oh my god like <laughs> what is all that I'm like that's what this thing is doing it's yeah well that's new. what's in getting into your lungs too because your lungs act like a filter in a way too so the, that's yeah. the same stuff you find on your filter that's what's going on your lungs um, well, that is super helpful. I have a last couple questions I ask everybody. I'm going to get you out of here. Is that okay? You got it. Sounds you got great. That for me, you're the greatest, um, Dr. Marr, When was the first time in your life when you realized yourself, your team, running for school council, whatever it might have been, when you had sort of the power of change or to do something meaningful? When were you like, oh, I moved the needle on something that I care about? It's probably like teaching, you know, kind of helping students understand something that they didn't understand before. And I would say that happened as early as, um, you know, when when I was an undergraduate, I was a TA for some courses. And then as a graduate student, also, I was a TA teaching assistant for some courses and really saw that, that, you know, people talk about that aha moment. It is really rewarding. And it's like all of a sudden someone... You've helped someone gain new knowledge. They have a better understanding of whatever whatever it is. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Who is someone uh, who has positively impacted your work in the past six months? In the past six months. Kind of like see. our pay it forward question. Yeah, everything's been a blur. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we just came out of a pandemic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, I have a collaborator, Seema Lakdawalla, who's at Emory University. She's a virologist who studies flu. And she and I have known each other for a long time, but I feel like she always, we, we always just like riff off each other on when we start talking about science and we're working on a, a paper right now that's that's pretty tough um, and in responding to reviewers' comments. And I feel like you know she's always pushing us to to really understand what's going on and to have, you know, have a, make sure our analysis of the data is as good as possible and that we are, yeah, thinking about everything we can and being as careful as we can. So thank you, Seema. <laughs> That's an important collaborator to have for sure. Um, last one is, what is a book uh, you've read? Obviously this year is pretty new, but in the past year or so, um, that has either changed your mind on something or uh, influenced the way um, you think about a topic? Um, I just finished a book, uh, the newer, latest book by Celeste Ng, which was, I can't remember the title of it, but it's about a, a, it's kind of pandemic influence, but it's about a kid who's, you know, they're worried, uh, there's been a lot of, I think, anti anti-Asian sentiment in the country. This is all fiction, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the kid's mother has left so that the kid wouldn't be taken away from his father. And it was about, you know, the kid trying to find his mother. Um, And the role of librarians, which I have newfound respect for. They Mm -hmm. operated almost like this underground railroad of kind of helping kids find their, their parents. And so it's, it's given me greater appreciation for librarians and also kind of the, the parent-child bond and how messed up society can be sometimes. Yeah, I think that's all fair. I am a huge fan of librarians. I now take my children to the same, about 50 yards that way, the same childhood kids portion of the public library that I went to as a kid and um, encouraging them, don't ask me for help, go introduce yourself talk to them about the things you like, ask for the help. That's what they're literally (laughs) went to school and trained to do. And just watching their enthusiasm and their their intentionality and and the caring they have uh, for obviously not just like a specific kid, much less my kid, but about that 
making sure that they are attending to their curiosity and, 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 you know, nourishing their passion for curiosity and for learning and just being in that space. It's, it's so amazing to watch. Yeah, I'm all about curiosity and knowledge and building our knowledge um, about, you know, every, everything really. And the librarians are like the superheroes of that because they, you know, you go to them, they can help you find, you you know, they don't know it all, but they can help you find it. Yeah, a hundred percent. If you were the librarian on air quality and a bunch of nerds who, who listen to podcasts wanted one place to start, what would you recommend when they came to your desk? Like a textbook? Do people read textbooks anymore or like a <laughs> website or? Um, I'm going to plead the fifth on whether I did enough reading in my textbooks, but where would okay. you say, hey, yeah, start here if you really want to understand sort of the, the the mechanics of it. Yeah, I would, you know, I'm, I'm going to say people don't read textbooks unless they have to because they're in a, in a taking some course, but there's a lot of really good information on the US EPA's website about air pollution. You know, they're, they're responsible for it. They even have, they also have good information about indoor air. You know, that's not, hasn't been their domain, but there's a group of researchers there who, who specialize in that. And so I would kind of start there with, there's a kind of, you could start with the six, we we call them criteria pollutants. These are ones that are regulated Mm -hmm. um, and that are measured in all across the country. And so, you know, look, look up criteria pollutants and there's lots of great information there about them. And then trying to think if there's like some kind of fiction book, there's what we need is like some dramatic plot book about air pollution, then I could send people to that kind of like there, there has been that for, I forgot the name of it, but for water quality. Um, that sounds great. Well, so, yeah, we'll I guess on. I'll have to write well, that. Yeah, that's right. I better get you out of here. Um, well, Dr. Marr, I can't thank you enough for your time for, for being, um, you know, such an important voice over the past few years. I'm sorry to your Twitter following has grown so much. Uh, but at the same time, Twitter might be over during this conversation. Who can know? Um, we'll find out when we get off. Um, but thank you, truly. I, I have learned a tremendous uh, amount from you from a distance, and it has been a pleasure and an honor to, to have you on to learn a little more. Thanks so much for having me. I've, I've enjoyed talking about my, my passion, of course, and thinking about it in new and different ways from your questions. That's it. Important Not Important is hosted by me, Quinn Emmett. It is produced by Willow Beck. Thanks for listening, and thanks for giving a shit.